Hello there, this is Ms. Nakayama, and today's lesson is 4.7 inverse trigonometric functions. We're going to talk about the inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent. We're going to use a calculator to evaluate those inverse functions, and then we're going to find exact values of composite functions with inverse trig functions. Now, before I jump into it, I think it's important to help your understanding of it to review inverse functions. So pause, see if you can answer these questions correctly, and then pick it back up and see how well you did. So first and foremost, how do we find inverse functions? Well, we switch the x and the y, domain and range. We've talked about that with exponential functions, square root, um, and quadratic functions, so forth, cubic and cube root. What characteristic must a function have for the inverse to be a function also? Well, that function must be one-to-one. -one. And how do we know if a function has this characteristic? The easiest way is to look at the graph and use the horizontal line test. And if you draw a horizontal line and cross the graph more than once, it is not a one-to-one -one function. It fails the horizontal line test. Do the sine and cosine and tangent functions have this characteristic? Well, hopefully from my description that I just gave you, you know the answer to that is no. So, um, this basically answers what I just talked to you about. But one other thing I want to point out to you, as the first question said, how do we find an inverse? And that is by switching the X and Y. So, you do want to remember that if you have the point AB on a graph, then that means that the point BA is on the graph of the inverse. And remember that this is the notation for inverse. And the graph of an inverse function is always a reflection of the original graph over the line y equals x. So let's talk about inverse trig functions. So when you look at these graphs, here is my cosine graph. Does it pass the horizontal line test? It does not. Inverse sine does not. And the tangent does not. So what we have to do is we have to restrict it. And we only take a piece of each of these graphs. And as you can hopefully tell from the red portion that I've highlighted, that's the piece we're going to take. And why did we choose those pieces? Well, in regards to the cosine and the sine, but we need to make sure that we get every value of the range. So we have to go between 1 and negative 1. So the cosine goes between 0 and pi. But if I tried to do that for the sine, you can see that I wouldn't get any negative sine values. So we pick that piece that's closest to the origin. And so that goes between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And the tangent, if I stick to the part that's closest to the origin, then I already cover all the y values. So again, we are looking for those that are closest to the origin and those that are symmetric. These two are symmetric. Now, so what does the inverse, if you think about taking 0, 1, and pi negative 1 and flipping those points, then your graph is going to look like this. Okay? Now, the sine and the tangent, when you do the same thing, look like this. And one of the things I want to point out to you, this is why this is so helpful, the inverse sine and the tangent are both symmetric to the origin, so their graph looks very similar. However, the tangent, I have asymptotes here, so in its inverse, the asymptotes are horizontal as opposed to vertical, okay? Now, what do you have to remember about this? And, and this information is very, very important, but I'm going to give you an idea of how to keep track of it and how to remember it. So, back with trig functions, when you originally have y equals cosine, y equals sine, y equals tangent, you input an angle and you output a number, what is the cosine of pi over 4 squared of 2 over 2? Okay, so if you keep in mind that the inverse means I'm switching the domain and the range, that's what's happened here. So now I'm going to input a number and output an angle. So you have to keep track. What's more important is you've got to keep track of what the possible range values are because you can't give a number that's outside of the range. So to me, the best way to remember that is I draw a circle, the unit circle, 
and I put these values, I label my unit circle, it kind of looks like this. So it says the cosine goes between zero and pi. That means the inverse cosine is in between. Your answer always has to be between zero and pi, one of these two quadrants. And the sine and the tangent have both of them, and they're in these two quadrants. But what you're going to mess up on and you're going to see, and I'm going to help you try to figure it out, remember that you can't give the answer of, of 7 pi over 4 because that's not between these two numbers. You have to give negative pi over 4. So keep that in mind as we're going through, and let's go do some examples. And while I'm doing this, y'all, if you get it like halfway through, pause and see if you can get the rest of them correct. Because when you take your lesson check, you will not get a scientific calculator. You will have a four-function calculator only. So you need to be able to do these without a calculator. So first off, inverse sine function. Okay, so remembering from the picture that I just drew, okay, sine is between the um, first and fourth quadrant, but I put negative pi over 2 because that's the range that has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. But if you pay attention... I'm going to help you remember how to remember what that's going to be. So this says, what is the inverse sine of square root of 2 over 2? It says that little symbol, this little symbol right here, y'all. Remember, we did it earlier. It says what angle has a sine of the square root of 2 over 2? And whether you use your hands or whether you know the unit circle, that answer is pi over 4. So go to B. I'm still looking for the angle, okay? But notice that there's a negative sign out here. And if you remember, the sign is an odd function. So you're safest to put that in your answer. And then just think, what angle has a sign of the square root of 3 over 2? Well, that's up high. So that's pi over 3. I got to carry the negative to my answer. So it's negative pi over 3. So you won't, that is in this quadrant. But it has to be less than negative pi over 2, which is why we have that answer. Okay. Inverse sine of 1. What angle has a sine of 1? Top of my unit circle is going to be pi over 2. What angle has a sine of 0? That is 0 over to the right. What angle has a sine of pi over 2? Okay, y'all, this is really what you're more familiar with as being an angle and not a number. So really what you need to remember is pi over 2 as a decimal is pi over 7, and that's larger than 1. So what angle has a sign that's larger than 1? Well, there is none, because we've already talked about the sign goes between negative 1 and 1, so that one is undefined. Okay, so you got to be careful about what's in the parentheses. Does it represent an angle? Okay, but you see that pi over 2, and a lot of people just answer it as, oh, the sign of pi over 2 is 1. But that's not what it's asking. It's asking for the angle. And this is a number. Okay, so inverse sine of negative one half. I'm going to have a, because of this negative sign in the question, my answer is going to be negative. And then I'm going to say, what angle has a sine of one half? That one's closer to the x-axis, so it's negative pi over six. Okay, let's practice some cosine functions. Cosine, remember, goes between the first and second quadrant. Every, every answer on this page is between 0 and pi, or it's undefined. So, again, this symbol says, what is the angle? What angle has a cosine of the square root of 2 over 2? And that is pi over 4. What angle has a cosine of negative square root of 3 over 2? So, this negative means I'm going to the second quadrant to find it. And cosine negative square root of 3 over 2 is the long side. So closer to pi is going to be, is going to be 5 pi over 6. If you have any trouble with this, with this y'all, please come see me. Okay, inverse cosine of 1. Where is the cosine equal to 1? And that's at 0. Where's the cosine equal to 0? Pi over 2. Where's the cosine equal to pi over 2? Well, remember, pi over 2 is that decimal of 1.57, which is larger than 1. Cosine can't be larger than 1, so it's undefined. Where's the cosine negative 1 half? Negative means negative cosine means I'm going to be in that second quadrant, and that's going to be 2 pi over 3. Okay? 
Let's do some tangent ones. Finding the exact value of the inverse tangent function. Tangent is like the sine, so it's in the first and the fourth quadrant between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So where is the tangent square root of 3 over 3? That is at pi over 6. Where is the inverse tangent negative square root of 3? So that negative means my answer is going to be negative. And it's not in this pi over 6 family because that one's in the pi over 6 family. So it's going to be negative pi over 3. Where's the, ang where's the tangent of an angle 1? That is pi over 4. Where's the tangent equal to 0? That is at 0. Where's the tangent undefined? Where is the tangent undefined? Well, in our range, it's never undefined, so it does not. Oh, Pooh Bear, that's pretty funny. Let's see what happens if I do that. It does not exist. Okay. Pi over 2 is not in our range, so it's not an issue. But if you were thinking about the top of the circle, okay, or the bottom of the circle, those values are actually not in our range because it's undefined. So it does not, the inverse function does not exist. And where is the tangent? Negative 1, negative e, my answer is going to be negative, so it's negative pi over 4. Okay. Next, these problems, use your calculator. You should pause it, pause the video right now and see if you can put these in your calculator. Make sure your calculator is in radians and you go to four decimal places. So pause and see if you can get the right answer. Unpause. The inverse cosine of one third. This tells you what button to push on your calculator. And that would be 1.230. The inverse tangent of negative 35.85 is negative 1.5429. Both of those are your answers in radians. Okay, properties of inverse. Y'all, this is the same um, composing of inverse functions that we had a lot with exponents and logs. When you compose inverse functions, you get what you started with as long as they are in your range. And that's what this is all telling you. And the only one that doesn't have a problem is this guy because every real number is in its range. So again, this is what this is, uh, this little picture is showing you and trying to help you remember what those values have to be. So look at these examples. Evaluating, comp evaluating compositions of functions and their inverses. So I'm looking, cosine of the inverse cosine. Well, those are inverses of each other, is 0.7. Can I take the cosine of 0.7? I can. So this is just 0 0.7, 0 0.7, okay? Inverse sine of the sine of pi. Can you take the sine of pi? You can take the sine of pi, so my answer is going to be pi. They just cancel each other out. If you want another way to do this, y'all, come see me. I will help you, okay? This says, what angle has a cosine of negative pi over 2? I mean, excuse me. What angle has a cosine of negative 1.2? And when you find that angle, go take the cosine of it. Well, what angle has a cosine of equal to negative 1.2? Well, y'all... Negative 1.2 is outside of our range of the cosine function, so there is no such angle, which means this is undefined. Okay? All right. Next, we got to talk about evaluating compositions of inverse functions. If it's not, okay, before we were composing inverse functions. These are not inverses of each other. So how do we want to do that? We are going to use triangles. Um, I think that's an easy way to do it. Um, I like X, Y, and R personally, but sometimes people struggle with this. So I'm going to go ahead and show it to you with the triangles. You can use either method, but you got to be able to pick out the right triangle when you do your homework. So when I talk about a triangle, remember, this is our picture. Theta is the acute angle made with the X axis. X is your horizontal movement. Y is your vertical movement. And R is the hypotenuse. And using our Pythagorean theorem, we know that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So when I'm trying to find, this says, what's the cosine of that angle whose sine is 5 over 6? So I'm going to draw a picture. All right, that's my same picture. Sine is, can y'all tell me? 
y over r. Okay, so that means this is 5 and this is 6 because that's my y and my r. Okay, that means I got to find this side. How am I going to find that side? I'm going to use the Pythagorean theorem, which is going to be 5 squared plus x squared equals 30, nope, equals 6 squared. So you're going to find out that x is the square root of 11. So what is cosine? Cosine is x over r. So that's just going to give me the square root of 11 over 6. All right, look at b. What is the tangent of the angle whose cosine is negative 8 over 17? Okay, when I drew this, y'all, I purposely drew it in the first quadrant because y was positive. I knew that inverse sine has to be in the first quadrant if it's positive. Okay, inverse cosine, if it's negative, has to be in the second quadrant. So when I draw that triangle, I'm drawing it here. Okay, and remember r, cosine is x over r. r is never negative. So that means this is basically my negative 8, and that's 17. So I'm trying to find this side here. What is that side right there? So I've got 8 squared, because you know me, I ignore the negative when I'm squaring it. 8 squared plus y squared equals 17 squared. And when you plug that in, you'll find out that this missing side is 15, and it's positive. And tangent is y over x. If you want to do opposite over adjacent, you can do that. But that gives me an answer of negative 15 over 8. Okay, look at this next one. Secant, what is the secant when the cosecant, what is the secant of the angle whose cosecant is 4? Y'all don't know this off the top of your head, so it is much easier to remember that cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine. So if you flip the trig function and the number, you get that this is the inverse sine of one fourth. That's the same angle. I took the reciprocal of this. I flipped the cosecant to get the sine. I flipped the four to get one fourth. So now when I go draw my picture, okay, y is, I mean, excuse me, sine is y over r. So my y is 1, and my r is 4. So I'm looking for this side here. So that's going to give me 1 squared plus x squared equals 4 squared. So y'all, this one I'm writing here, this would be what you could write on your paper to show your work. Okay? Um, and that's going to find out that x is the square root of 15. Okay? Secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. Cosine, remember, was x over r, so secant is going to be r over x, and our r is the square root of 15. No, r over x is going to be 4 over the square root of 15, which rationalizes to 4 squared, so 15 over 15. Okay, last example. Sometimes you don't have any numbers at all, y'all. What is the cosine of the angle whose tangent is 4x. So still use your triangles, okay? I've got tangent. Tangent is y over x. So that means that the y, the vertical, is 4x and the horizontal is 1 because 4x is the same as 4x over 1. And I'm looking for the missing side, which is my hypotenuse. So I'm going to have 1 squared plus... 4x squared equals c squared, or no, excuse me, not c squared, r squared. So that is 1 plus 16x squared. That's where y'all got to be pay attention to. When you square 4x, you got to square the 4 and the x. So this missing side is the square root of 16x squared plus 1. So cosine is x over r. So that means the cosine is 1. Ah, oh, poo. I don't want to give you the answer. It's 1 over the square root of 16x squared plus 1. 
And when you rationalize it, it looks like that. You already had a sneak peek. Okay, so that last slide is just going, um, reminding you again of what the graphs look like and what the ranges are, but I like my circle. It helps me keep up where things are. Thank you so much for watching, y'all. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to come see me or email me. Thank you so much. Have a great day.